What happened when I got to Chile and took over this uh, team? Let us look at a little diagram to show how I set about things. I built it up on a piece of paper lying on the table between us. Then a system three and a system four, and I got that far. And then I got to system five, and I drew a, a big histrionic breath. And I said, I was going to say, this compañero presidente is you. Before I could say it, he suddenly smiled very broadly and he said, ah, system five at last, the people. The people at last, the people. What you've clicked on here is a short story. It's a true story, not too long past, about a future trapped in the past. There are those things you hope for in a good story, drama, plots, heroes, sages, are better angels and bitter devils. But, and I'll spoil this for you, it's a tragedy. Though it would be more of a tragedy that it remained history. It's undeniably the history of our present, this friction-free present, a planetary network of automated machines, of one government with a face and one without, a fantastical assemblage of networks, profits, control, consciousnesses, and behind it all something faceless, but something we know is woven through it. Welcome, family, to another edition of Stranger Thinking Media, where we address the problems of a modern world. This is Yesha Yahoo. Stay tuned. We're going to talk about the brain of the firm, AI, the mind of Ashitan. The origins of the modern day matrix. AI, the mind of Satan. Topics covered from stars to cells, control and complex systems, where the whole defies the parts. A Chile, Chilean experiment in economic control, brain of the firm, and the grand finale. Welcome to our channel. Please like, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And most of all, enjoy the show. Revelation chapter 2, verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So this is going to be about um, a system of systems. And I'm going to tell a little backstory here. I remember when I was going to get my master's degree, um, there was a class I had called Computers and Cognition. And in that class, we had to do a thesis paper. And being that it was Computers and Cognition, it had to be computer and cognition related, right? So I came up with the brilliant idea of, hey, I'd like to do... Um, a story, uh, I guess a thesis on creating an organization that actually acts like the human brain. And so class time came around and everybody had to stand up and say what they were going to talk on or what their thesis was going to be about. And everybody went around the room and it got to me. And this was back in 1992 and computers were just really starting to, you know, catch on, you know. Um, we, we had gotten out of the punch card phase and we were now in the, we were getting beyond the, uh, the magnetic tape phase and we were starting to get towards that optical disc phase. So that's where we were. So it was about 1992. And so I stood up and I said, I want to create an organization that acts like the human brain. And I kid you not, everybody in the class started laughing. And I felt, you know, just like 
like an ant. Like it just starts shrinking. <laughs> so, I mean, then they wouldn't stop. I mean, they're talking to each other. Everybody's ignoring the teacher now. Everybody's just like der deriding me and, you know, joking me. And I was like, wow, is it that bad? And it, the, the professor, he, he turned his back on the class and just started writing on the chalkboard. So everybody's still talking, talking, and, and he's writing. And then one by one, everybody notices he's writing on the blackboard. And so the class started quieting, quieting down one by one. It just got a little quieter and a little quieter until everybody was focused on that blackboard. And what the professor wrote, he wrote uh, like about 14 book titles. And when he got to the last one, he turned around and he looked at me and he said, very good. Because apparently, and I thought this was a novel idea on my part, apparently this was no new idea. In fact, millions Maybe even billions were already spent to accomplish this very thing. And we're going to look, and this video is going to take you into that. So this was the beginnings of the, essentially the internet. I know what they tell you. Oh, it, up at CERN, there was a scientist and it was he who created the internet. No, this is, this stuff was planned out a long time ago, as you will see in the video so check this out the universe is a symphony of complexity from the intricate dance of galaxies to the delicate balance of ecosystems complexity surrounds us it is in the vast networks of stars that make up our Milky Way it's in the intricate machinery within a single human cell we often think of complexity as something chaotic, something difficult to understand. But complexity is not chaos. It is order, but on a grand scale. Imagine a bustling city, millions of individuals, each with their own goals and desires, interact in a complex web of relationships. Yet somehow, the city functions, traffic flows, businesses thrive, people connect. This is the essence of complexity emergent order arising from seemingly chaotic interactions. The study of complexity is about understanding these intricate systems. By unraveling the threads that connect the parts, we can begin to comprehend the behavior of the whole. Consider a flock of birds soaring through the sky. The flock moves with remarkable coordination, twisting and turning as one cohesive unit. But there is no single leader dictating every movement. Each bird responds to its neighbors, adjusting its flight path based on their positions and movements. This distributed form of control is common in complex systems. Think of an ant colony. Thousands of ants, each following simple rules, can build elaborate structures and navigate complex environments. Even our own bodies rely on complex systems. Our nervous system, a vast network of neurons, processes information and coordinates our actions without a single point of control. This distributed intelligence allows for remarkable adaptability and resilience. Understanding the principles of control in complex systems is crucial for navigating our increasingly interconnected world. From managing global supply chains to designing intelligent machines, the ability to harness the power of distributed intelligence will shape our future. One of the defining characteristics of complex systems is emergence. Emergence is the idea that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. In other words, the collective behavior of a system cannot be predicted solely by understanding its individual components. Imagine a single neuron. It is a remarkably complex cell, capable of processing information and communicating with other neurons. But a single neuron, in isolation, cannot think or feel. It is only through the interconnected network of billions of neurons that the emergent properties of consciousness and intelligence arise. The same principle applies to other complex systems. The behavior of a stock market, for example, is not simply the sum of individual investors' decisions. It is the result of complex interactions between buyers and sellers, influenced by a myriad of factors, from global events to social media trends. Understanding emergence is essential for comprehending the behavior of complex systems
It requires a shift in perspective, from focusing on individual components to analysing the interactions and relationships that give rise to emergent properties. In the early 1970s, a remarkable experiment unfolded in Chile. Project CyberSyn, spearheaded by the Allende government, sought to apply the principles of cybernetics to manage the Chilean economy. Cybernetics, a field that emerged in the mid-20th century, focused on understanding and controlling systems through feedback loops and information processing. Project CyberSyn aimed to create a real-time information system that could monitor key economic indicators, such as production levels and resource allocation. At the heart of the project was a sophisticated computer network designed to collect and analyze economic data from across the country. This information would then be relayed to a central control room, where a team of experts could monitor the state of the economy and make informed decisions. While Project CyberSyn ultimately fell short of its ambitious goals, it stands as a testament to the human desire to understand and control complex systems. It also foreshadowed the increasing role of technology in shaping our economic and social lives. So there you have it. Uh, well, just to let you know, in that course I was telling you about, um, I got an A. <laughs> so, and a little bit more about that. Basically, I was... Uh, I did a paper and it uh, basically looked at the trends. Now you gotta you gotta understand this was before you had internet, but you knew it was something like that was coming. You knew it, right? There was rumblings about it, so it, it was a lot of digitized information. So immediately, being a music fanatic. I created a fictitious company called Radioactive Software. And we immediately just, as part of the research, we started calling around to different radio stations. Because at that time, DJs were still spinning vinyl, right? And so um, the optical disc had just came out. And at that time, they were these big, huge discs. And they were basically for storage. But the capability was there for read-write. Now that was, at that point in time, it was, uh, you know, you didn't have it on your computer. Um, so there were companies that could write to optical discs. So it was like a specialty thing at that point. But you could see it coming. And so what we, what we did was call various radio stations and told them, hey, we're developing a, a jukebox, a digital jukebox that would hold, you know, hundreds of thousands of songs that you could recall, you know, just by doing a simple word search, right? And I know today that sounds like, uh, duh, right? But back then, it was like unheard of because you had to, literally, if you go to a radio station, the DJ had a wall full of vinyl albums, right? And he just had them in alphabetical order and he had to find them, you know? So I said, hey, what if we give you a, a, a jukebox with optical discs? where you can just do the search for the, you know, the actual song or album. And they went crazy. I, I'm telling you, it, they went nuts when I presented that idea. Now, the idea was so good that um, the faculty came to my dissertation. They were like, <laughs> they literally wanted to start this company. And, uh, you know, it, I didn't do it because I had so many other things going on. Plus, I didn't actually know how to do it. You know, um, we could present it at trade shows. You'd have to get the thing built and then present it at trade shows. But the idea was digitizing music and, and, and being able to get to your songs at the touch of a button, right? Which we have now, right? And, of course, the rumblings of the Internet were there and... Um, and it already kind of existed, but it was, again, a specialty use, um, mainly amongst uh, academia and the military and, you know, uh, special science uh, projects like CERN, for instance. Um, but it was there, and you knew at some point you wouldn't even need a digital jukebox. It would be um, a neural netting, 
So the term internet really means, it comes from the term neural net. So the internet is simply um, mimicry of the human brain, where you don't have any central leadership, like a flock of birds. Every computer is tied to, is tethered together and can talk to any computer. So the, so the sum information worldwide that's on everybody's PC is part of the hive. And that's basically kind of what the internet is, right? It's a giant brain. So I guess the question is, and what I'm kind of looking at here is, whose brain is it? You know, um, I, I, I have my suspicions. I know whose brain. The internet's actually, an, it, at this point, it's a living organism. It is a brain. But whose brain is it? And I have my sneaking suspicions that uh, the forces that be, um, if you understand the spiritual aspects of it, the Most High, he can be everywhere at once. He can indwell in believers all at the same time. Um, the Satans can't do that. What they are doing is presenting knowledge to man to create a system whereby they can mimic the Most High's ability. And the Most High does this through his Holy Spirit, Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, where he's able to aspirate himself and indwell in everybody all at the same time. And the angels can't do that. I mean, your, your created Elohim cannot, cannot do that, right? So he's, in, he's uh, remember, the watchers were the ones that gave humans knowledge, technology. And it's still going on. And so what you see is the Satans having man create systems that they can ultimately take over and use to perform the same basic function as the Holy Spirit. In other words, be able to put their, uh, I, their ideas and their agendas out there and get it into everybody's minds at the same time. So kind of a fake Holy Spirit, if you will. Um, but not only that, they have those people over at CERN, and I'm going to do a video about CERN again, trying to punch a, a hole in the space-time continuum to unleash, to, to, to loose those that are bound. And I know that might sound crazy to some of you, but because, you know, you think, oh, that's not scientific. No, it's very scientific. It is very scientific. So we know there's more than one dimension, or uh, I should say it this way. We have mathematically shown that these are very possible, probable realities. How to get from one uh, dimension to another? Well, they talk about wormholes. Well, no one's ever seen a wormhole, but yet mathematically they should exist, and they should be because they are filled with uh, what we call exotic matter, um, something that repels gravity, uh, unlike uh, regular matter, which creates gravitational fields. Exotic matter would repel gravitational fields, creating a hole in the space-time continuum. I know this is like way out there, but this is uh, mathematical principles that scientists are monitoring and they are using CERN to try to recreate uh, the, what they call the Big Bang. Um, where did everything come from? They're trying to go all the way back to, and try to you know, mimic and reproduce the conditions at that moment. So anyway, um, there's a lot going on and average Joe has no clue where his tax dollars are going. <laughs> but there's a lot going on and we need to pay attention to some of this stuff because it will affect you. So this video is about large and complicated systems such as animals, computers, and economies. It is in particular about the control of the enterprise, the brain of the firm. That is a difficult subject, difficult to think about or to read about, difficult to write about. But we're going to get into it. When the white rabbit asked the king where he should begin, the king replied, begin at the beginning and go on until you come to the end, then stop. But explanation is not like that. His advice is a good example of the failure to recognize when one is up against a large, complex system. 
Let me pause right there. Now, this is coming out of a book that, remember I said my professor wrote on a blackboard about 14 book titles? Well, one of the book titles was called Brain of the Firm. And <laughs> I recommend you read that because that's going to tell you a lot about where everything is going. Um, these systems are being put in place primarily, yeah, for efficiency, but control. You know, there's a lot going on here. This particular system begin, begins with two subsystems themselves, almost unthinkably complicated, called the author and the reader. It goes on uh, with the topic, uh, the subject matter, also complicated, by which alone they will be connected. It then seeks to weld the three subsystems into a meaningful whole that is what communication is all about ultimately and it's not easily done so you have the two systems um, the author and the reader essentially in this particular case and the thing that connects connects them is the information so you know to get a, a the whole system to work all this has to work in unison without uh, prompting essentially so if you think about it, we went from mainframes down to to the internet, right? And the difference is a mainframe is limited in its knowledge. I mean, you can stuff data into it as much as you want, but it's still limited. Whereas if you just connect everybody's computers together, everything everybody's thinking anywhere in the world becomes the sum knowledge. So it's really the internet is the sum knowledge of all humanity, essentially. And uh, that's where we're at now. So a massive application of this whole approach to management, cybernetics, had been undertaken in 1971 to 73 in Chile. The eventual overthrow of President Allende's administration was a traumatic experience for the Chileans. This event marked the beginnings of the Internet and consequently AI. And so AI, if you think about it, is is taking all of that uh, that system and squashing it down into a more compact system inside of a single, if you will, uh, cybernetic organism. And that's basically what a robot would be. Um, and if that robot is AI, I mean, that's what it would truly be. So it would be linked, of course, to the internet and drawing on the sum of all human knowledge and then it just needs a control system where it can free flow information to where it can make its own decisions, you know, just like we do. That's what our brain does. So it's not some out there concept. It's, uh, if you want to create a really great organism, just look at the creation around you. That's why I say, if man could sit back and concoct these things, does that mean, doesn't that tell you that they are just have this creative ability? And, and if man is creative, what makes you think there's not a higher uh, being with that we, we are just chips off the old block and we're creative because the one that created us is creative. And now we just mimic what he's already put in place for, for bad or for good. And we'll, we shall see. But as you saw, uh, Lende's government fell after trying to implement this. So if they're trying to implement, implement this worldwide, um, you know, that might be kind of a lesson. You know, uh, so we'll, we'll continue here. But where, when, and why did these concepts first arise? What was the question that needed to be answered? And that question was, how can humanity be organized to mimic the human brain? The most organized thing that we could think of is the human brain. And it has no leader. It's hive. It's a hive uh, function. It just does. So Matthew chapter twenty-four, verse twenty-one. For then there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No more shall ever be. And except those days should be shortened, there shall be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. I'm going to cut this short at this point in time. Um, it's 
lot to think about there. I hope you guys could follow what I was talking about. Uh, but on that note, I'll say I love you all so much. And thank you so much for continually supporting my content. If you did enjoy this video, hit the thumbs up button. Subscribe and turn on the notification bell. And share this with your friends and family. I'm sure they would find it interesting as well. I'm very excited to continue this journey with you. I thank you all for being, bringing certain stories to my attention and for continually keeping me updated with certain events around the world. And there's a lot going on these days. We live in exciting times. So, I very much appreciate you all. Shout out to the channel members. And may everybody have a beautiful and blessed day. Who's in the body of Messiah? Yahusha Hamashiach. And I'll see you guys on the next video. Shalom.